Lamentations chapter 4. And so the city is in ruin. The city is in ashes. The temple is torn down. And so Jeremiah here is really mourning the loss of the city. And he's mourning the loss of the temple. He's mourning the loss of everything that he knows. He's mourning the loss of the people as they've been carried away into captivity. But when we get into chapter 4, he begins to look at here that this is not the work of man, as he looks to say this isn't Babylon. It was God who did this to the city. It was God who did this to his people. And keep in mind that so often when bad things happen, there are times where, you know, we, we looked at last week where um, if, if there is an unjust, God is going to deal with those things in time. He'll do that. But a lot of times the things that happen in our life are a form of correcting, that God wants to bring us back under that place where he can pour out his blessings. He wants to bring us back to that place of his will. But when we rebel against that, God has a tendency of putting roadblocks in our way, putting pitfalls before us, and really turning up the heat in our lives so that through that affliction that we come back to the Lord. It says in verse 3, even the jackals present their breast to nurse their young. Talks about where we call them scavengers. I don't know if you've seen jackals, but these are those wild dogs, these things that will come in and they scavenge everything. And so we would look down at the scavengers. And it's interesting, you might want to just mark that or highlight it, that he talks about the jackals, the scavengers of the land, what they'll do is this. If they have young, they're going to nurse them. They're going to take care of the young. What we would consider, you know, just basically this, this disgusting scavenging animal, at least it takes care of its young. But it says this in the middle of verse 3, but the daughters of my people is cruel, but the daughter of my people is cruel, like ostriches in the wilderness the tongue of the infant clings to the roof of its mouth for thirst. The young children ask for bread, but no one breaks it for them. What's happening now is in the siege that it happened, the people are starving. And even as a jackal will say, hey, yeah, I'm going to give my breast to my young. A mother's going to feed her young. Here, these infants, they're dying of thirst. They're dying of hunger. And it says here that the daughter of my people is like an ostrich in the wilderness. Now, the crazy thing is this. Ostriches make no nests. They lay their eggs and they leave them. They'll walk on them. They'll trample on them. They, they really have no idea what motherhood is. Ostriches are really, really dumb animals. No parenting instincts at all. They'll just lay an egg and off they go. Now, you've never seen an ostrich nest. It just doesn't happen. And so... The fact that there's any ostriches all is amazing. However, their eggs are pretty tough to break into. But that's all they do. They lay and they move on. And so he's saying that here the daughters are really have no parenting instinct, almost like the ostrich. Verse 4, the tongue of the infant clings to the roof of its mouth for thirst. They, they need to drink. The young children ask for bread and no one is going to break it, give it to them. And then it says this, verse 5, those who ate delicacies are desolate in the streets and those who were brought up in scarlet embrace ash heaps now it's interesting that in verse 5 it says those who once ate the delicacies those who were refined those who were of the upper class well at this point they're desolates in the street they're now starving they 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 are thinking well what good is all my money <laughs> i have no food and then it makes a statement at the end of verse 5, those who were brought up in scarlet are now embracing ash heaps. In other words, those people who are wearing the royal robes, those people who are wearing the regal clothes, they're, they're at this point all dirty. They're, they're rummaging around in garbage heaps. They're rummaging around in garbage piles. So in other words, they're, they're at one point were dressed fine and regal, and now they're just scavenging through the burned piles, and they're scavenging, scavenging through any garbage to say, is there a scrap of food that I can eat? I'll tell you what, how great is their fall? 
They're not worried about how pristine they look. They're worried just about eating. And so those who, you know, basically had and were brought up in scarlet that wore the fine clothes, they're just rummaging around in the, the heaps trying to find anything. So now they're starving and now they're scavenging those who are of the upper class. And then verse 6, the punishment of the iniquity of the daughter of my people is greater than the punishment of the sin of Sodom, which was overthrown in a moment with no hand to help her. Now, verse 6 shifts just a little bit because it talks about the punishment of the iniquity of the daughter of my people. It speaks about the punishment that is happening to Israel, Jerusalem, Judea, and it says that that punishment is greater than the punishment of the sin of Sodom. Now, with the sin of Sodom, keep in mind that Sodom and Gomorrah did not know God. And so what God did is this, that he judged them instantly. That one day they were carrying around like everything was good, and the very next day they were all destroyed. It was instant. It was at a moment. Fire and brimstone coming down. It is now all destroyed. And so their punishment, although it was very devastating, was one thing. It was quick and not a lot of suffering. But the punishment that was now happening to Judah, to Jerusalem, was slow, painful anguish. They were starving a little more day after day. They were just compromising everything they once held dear day after day. The city was being besieged day after day. People were dropping like flies day after day. And so they were just in turmoil. But keep in mind, this turmoil continued and continued and continued. And I'll tell you what, I'd rather have something happen quick and say, hey, just, you know, just do it fast. You know, rip off a band-aid, but do it fast versus then plucking all the hairs off one by one by one by one. Just rip it off. Get it over with. Now, that's why he says here, the punishment of the iniquity of my daughter people, of, of the daughter of my people is greater than the punishment. Their punishment is slow and painful. And then it says this, Although Sodom and Gomorrah was overthrown in a moment with no hand to help her, verse 7, her Nazarites were brighter than snow and whiter than milk. They were more ruddy in body than the rubies, like sapphire in their appearance. So all these Nazarites who didn't drink wine were very healthy, walking with God. But look at verse 8. Now their appearance is blacker than soot. They go unrecognized in the streets. Their skin clings to their bones and has become as dry as wood. In other words, they just waste away to nothing. They used to be healthy. They used to be the ones that everybody would look to, and now they can't even recognize the Nazarites anymore. And it declares this now in verse 9, Those slain by the sword are better off than those who die of hunger, for these pine away stricken for the lack of the fruits of the field. So we see here, this what, it's better to die instantly. Just, just take a sword, cut off my head, let it be done, plunge me through. I don't want to have to suffer day after day after day, slowly starving. And this is what he's dealing with. He says, those who are there slain by the sword, they're better off than those who are slowly dying of hunger. These are pining away. They're wasting away. Well, it says in verse hand, the hand of the compassionate woman have cooked their own children. They have become food for them in the destruction of the daughter of my people. So at this point, we're seeing here this next portion where the very women who were compassionate. Now, these women here weren't just mothers. These were the kind of mothers that everybody would look to on Mother's Day and say, I wish she was my mom. She's so tender and so compassionate and so giving. Well, all of a sudden, these women who were at one point were so compassionate, they're now cooking their own children. There's a portion of scripture for you note takers. You can jot this down in Deuteronomy chapter 28. And it declares this in Deuteronomy 28, beginning in verse 52. 
they shall besiege you at all your gates until your high and fortified walls, which you trust, come down throughout all your land, and they shall besiege you at all your gates throughout all your land, which the Lord your God is giving you. So here God is telling the children of Israel, listen, if you serve me, there's going to be blessings, but if you don't serve me, if you go your own way, and if you serve your idols, these things will come upon the sons of disobedience. And he makes this statement, he said, you're going to be besieged, you're going to be slowly but surely, you won't be able to get out, you won't be able to eat, you're going to be, you know, stuck inside your walls. Verse 3 says this, you shall eat the fruit of your own body, the flesh of your sons and your daughters, whom the Lord your God has given you in the siege and the desperate straits in which your enemies shall distress you. The very sensitive and very refined man among you will be hostile towards his brother, towards the wife of his bosom, and toward the rest of his children whom he leaves behind, so that he will not give any of them the flesh of his children whom he will eat. This is absolutely crazy. This man so starving, he's going to say, no, no one, this is my food. Yes, he was your brother. Yes, he was, he was your sister. This is my food. And so he goes on to say that he will... Um, nor will he give him, verse 55, any of the flesh of his children whom he will eat because he has nothing left in the siege and desperate straits in which your enemy shall distress you at all your gates. The tender and delicate woman among you whom, who would not venture to set her, the sole of her foot on the ground because of her delicateness and sensitivity will refuse the husband of her bosom and her son and her daughter, her placenta which comes out from between her feet and her children whom she bears, for she will eat them secretly for lack of everything that is in the siege and desperate straits in which your enemy shall distress you at your gates. So the husband is going to say, no, this is my food. Yes, your brother and sister. Now the wife, she's more delicate. She won't even tell anyone that she gave birth. And then she'll eat the child that she's just given birth to. This is here what God is trying to deal with this nation, saying, listen, you guys are at this place, and keep in mind that it is going to be better for you to do one thing, die from the sword instantly versus dying from hunger. Because, verse 10, the hands of the compassionate woman have cooked their own children, they become food for them in the, in, the, in the destruction of the daughter of my people. So because of what God is doing, and keep in mind, we see that the destruction of the daughter of my people, this is God who's going to be doing the work. Verse 11, the Lord has fulfilled his fury. He has poured out his fierce anger. He kindled a fire in Zion and has devoured its foundations. So we see here that it's God who's done this work. It's not Babylon. Babylon is a vessel, but God has used Babylon. And so it's the Lord who is fulfilling his fury. God is pouring out his anger because the children of Israel have rejected him. And it's one of those things where the children of Israel just thought, I can go and I can do what I want to do. I'm not accountable to my creator. I'm not accountable to he who would become my savior. And we recognize that God says, listen, I've done everything for you. I'm the one who brought you into this land. I'm the one who gave you this land. And he says, I'm, I'm taking it back. You don't deserve this land. You don't deserve these blessings. Because your life isn't bearing witness to what? That you're my children. And so God just says, I'm going to fulfill my fury. I'm going to pour out my anger. And I'm going to kindle a fire in Zion. And then verse 12, it says this, The kings of the earth and all the inhabitants of the world would not have believed that the adversary and the enemy could enter the gates of Jerusalem. Anyone who knew 
Jerusalem, when God poured its blessings upon it, said there's no way, there's no way that any enemy could ever come against God and take out the children of Israel. Well, keep in mind that God said what? I'm going to strengthen the enemy and I'm going to remove my right hand, that hand of strength that would prevent them from coming in. I'm just going to back off and say, hey, come right on in. And it says that every nation is going to be shaking their heads. They won't even believe that an adversary can come in. And know this, an adversary can't. The enemy can do nothing unless what? Unless God gives them permission. And often what God will do is he'll say, you know what? <laughs> I need this person corrected. Yeah, go ahead. Have your way with them for a little while. And it's interesting that even Paul, as he was writing to the church in Corinth, says, listen, you gave that man over to the enemy that was fine, but now welcome him back. He's, he's already suffered. He's repented now. Bring him back. Love him again. But so often you have to just deliver such a one to Satan for what? For the destruction of the flesh that the soul may be saved. God allows the enemy to come in and to destroy so that we come back to the place of what? Just clinging to God. And so here, all of, all of the other kings of the earth are shaking their heads saying, how could this be? Well, it says this in verse 13. Because of the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priest, who shed in her midst the blood of the just. Verse 17, still our eyes failed us, watching vainly for our help, trying to say who's going to help us, who's going to save us. And he says, and no one ever came. We're just watching and watching and watching so their eyes could no longer focus. In our watching, we watched for a nation that could not save us. In other words, no one ever came. Verse 18, they tracked our steps so that we could not walk in our streets. Our end was near. Our days were over, for our end had come. I wrote in my Bible here at the end of verse 18, I wrote, going, going, gone. And that's exactly what it sounds like. Look at the end of verse 18 again. Our end was near. Going. Our days were over. Going. Our end had come. Gone. Now chapter 5. We begin to see here the shifts from a poem now to a prayer. And we, we see this, it begins this, remember, O Lord, what has come upon us. It's interesting that here, the, the, it, it opens up and it talks about God. Would you remember, would you look upon us, what has come upon us? Look and behold our reproach. It's interesting that once all of this devastation has happened, they go to the Lord and say, God, would you, would you look at me? Would you acknowledge me? Would you see the state that I am in? And I think, why do we wait so long to cry out to God to say, I'm, I'm, I've just made such a mess of my life, now I'm going to come to you. <laughs> it's, why do we have to wait till we make a mess of our lives? I think the wisdom is this what? That as soon as we find the word of God, is in opposition to where we are at in life, acknowledge those things to God, come back and walk those things that you can walk, repent of those things to say, yes, Lord, I was in error. I want to come back and do those first works again. But what happens is if we choose not to repent of one thing, then we take the step further on to the next thing. If we choose not to repent of that, we take the step further on beyond that and the next step after that. Remember, we've looked before at King David, and there it said before he you know, sinned with Bathsheba, before he murdered Uriah the Hittite, it said it was the season in which kings went out to war. It was the springtime. Kings went out to war. It says this, but David stayed home at the palace. He should have been battling. He should have said, this is where I'm supposed to be. This is where I need to be. It is a season where kings went out to war. And David said, well, I don't have to. I can take it easy. And I'll tell you what, dear Christian, any time that we think that I can take it easy from the battle, that I don't have to go before the Lord and look to his word and abide in his word and seek to let my life mirror this word, 
When I think I can take it easy, rest just a little bit, know this, be careful because you're going to take another step. And when David didn't go out to war, he could have just said, hey, it was the season, I should be at war. Father, forgive me, let me go to battle. But David didn't. David went out on his balcony, he saw a woman bathing, she was beautiful. And then he inquired of the woman. Now, rather than when he saw the woman bathing, it was beautiful, he should have just hit his eyes, went back inside. He should have went, you know, and said, hey, you know what, I'm sorry, Lord, and, you know, if you needed to go to your wives, go to your concubines, do something. But he didn't. He went and inquired who she was. Then he found out that she was the wife of Uriah the Hittite, one of his mighty men, one of his men. And then he called for her, brought her in, had relations with her. She was pregnant. But here, David, he could have repented at any time. He could have repented, you know, when he, when he called her to the place, you know, I'm so sorry, I should not have done this. And, and when he found out, hey, she's the wife. Hey, I'm sorry, Lord, that I looked at another man's wife. I'm sorry that I coveted another man's wife. He could have said, hey, Lord, I'm sorry that he could have repented at any time. But because he doesn't repent initially, he takes the next step. And why do we always wait until we're all the way down the road? Until like Nathan the prophet comes and says, you're the man. You're the one that did this. You're the one that sinned. You're the one that at, at, is at that place. Why do we wait until it's too late in order to repent? Why don't we come to the Lord right away? Well, because we think, hey, if God hasn't punished me now, maybe it's okay. No, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If it's in his word, it's in his word. And God is long-suffering. Don't get me wrong. He is long-suffering, but he's going to deal with it. The, the fact of the matter is what you sow, you shall reap. And so here he's at that point. Their condition is now just devastation upon devastation. And now he says, remember, O Lord, what has come upon us. God said, I know what came upon you. I'm the one that did this. I'm the one that allowed this situation to come to this place. Why? So that you would come to an end of yourself and realize that without me, you can do nothing. But then you would learn this valuable lesson that with me, all things are possible. That's the heart of God. And so he goes, remember, O Lord, what has come upon us. Look and behold our reproach. Our inheritance, verse 2, has been turned over to aliens. And our houses to foreigners. Well, verse 7, our fathers sinned and are no more. But we bear their iniquities. Now, verse 7 is one of those verses where just because someone says something does not necessarily mean that this is God's heart. This is what they were saying. And they were saying, our fathers sinned, and they're dead, and we're having to bear their iniquities. We're having to live with the consequences of our father's sins. Well, oh my goodness. Let me share with you just a passage. Jot this down, Ezekiel chapter 18. So here, Ezekiel chapter 18, beginning in verses 1 through 4. The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, What do you mean when you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, Our fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set in edge. Now, what they were saying is this. Our fathers ate the sour grapes, and the children go, they were squishing their teeth like they bit into a lemon or a sour grape. Now keep in mind that because our fathers ate the grape, we're suffering the consequences. Just what they're saying here. Our fathers sinned and are no more, and we bear their iniquities. This is the proverb they were saying. Our fathers eat in sour grapes, and our children's teeth are set in edge. Well, <laughs> verse 3, here's what God says. As I live, says the Lord, you shall no longer use this proverb in Israel. You can't blame who you are on your parents anymore. And I think it's interesting that aren't our parents easiest to be our scapegoats? Our parents, it's because my parents did this, my parents didn't do this. My parents should have done that, my parents did this instead. I'll tell you what, have you ever seen or you've, you've read articles where people... Children have grown up in the most deplorable and desolate of circumstances, and they've risen to become children or, you know, young adults of impeccable character. 
It isn't, it isn't your upbringing, it's your choices. It's your choices. Live with it, deal with it. Don't blame your parents anymore. But this is what they were doing. And they're saying, oh, our fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set at edge. And God says, no, no more are you going to use this proverb. No more are you going to blame your parents. You're going to make a choice for what you want to do. Regardless of your past, you can choose something different. Just because your parents were, were not the best parents doesn't mean that what? That you have to do what they do. Because how do you know they were bad parents? Because somewhere in your mind you know what a good parent is. You know what a good adult is. Well, then be that good adult that you know your parents weren't. You can choose to do that path. And so the Lord says, Behold, as I live, says the Lord God, you shall no longer use that proverb in Israel. He says in verse 4, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. And the soul who sins shall die. In other words, you're going to deal with your own consequences. It's what you do that's going to cause me to judge. Now, in verse 9, it says this. If he has walked in my statutes and kept my judgments faithfully, he is just, he shall surely live, says the Lord God. He says, hey, if you do what's good, you're going to be fine. Now, in verses 19 through 21, he says this, Yet you say, why should the son not bear the guilt of the father? He says, why, why won't you deal with the son? Because if the father is bad, isn't the son going to be bad? He says, so, verse 19, why, yet you say, why should the son not bear the guilt of the father? Because the son has done what is lawful and right. If the parents are wrong and the son does right, He's kept all my statutes and he observed them. He shall surely live. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Now, two other verses to make note of, verse 21 and verse 24. Verse 21 says this, But if a wicked man turns from all his sin which he has committed, keeps all my statutes, and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. I love this verse. Why? Because that's me. Wicked. And then turning, repenting, and saying, Listen, if the wicked turns from his sins, but I'm not going to go there anymore. I'm going to come to you, Lord. God says to that person, no matter where you've been, no matter how wicked you've been, if you come to me, you're not going to be my child. I'm going to set my love upon you, and you're going to live. You're going to live. You're going to live in me and live with me. But he says in verse 24, and here's the the other warning, but if a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, Shall he live? All the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered because of the unfaithfulness of which he is guilty and the sin which he has committed because of them he shall die. God says you can't live in the past. You live in the now. And I love that because the enemy does what? He always wants you to go into the past. The enemy says, Lowell, look at who you were. Look at what you did. But God says, no, no, look at what you're doing now. You've turned from it and you've turned to me. And I'm going to bless you. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to make your life amazing in me. But if you are, are one of those who said, but I used to do this and I used to do this. Well, if you're not doing it now, it doesn't count. God wants your testimony to be up to date. He says, what are you doing now for me? And so if you are, you know, once walked with God and now you're not, God says, hey, you know, you got to be careful because you can't, Rest on what you used to do. What you need to do is you rest on what you're doing. Walk with me now. And so we see here, and this is a beautiful portion where there in verse 7, back in our text of of, um, Lamentations 5, our fathers sinned and are no more, but we bear their iniquities. God says, oh, no, you don't. You're bearing your own iniquities. Then it says this in verse 8, servants rule over us. And there is none to deliver us from their hand. 
So basically, what they're saying is this normal order of society and where you had the rulers and the servants, it's all topsy-turvy. No one can make heads or tails of what's going on now. Everything is kind of crazy. It used to be where the rulers would rule and the servants would serve, and now there are no rulers. And the servants are there saying, uh, what do I want me to do? <laughs> I'm not here to rule over anyone. And so basically, it says here, there's none to rule servants rule over us there's none to deliver us from their hand there's no great leaders that are going to come and protect us and watch over us they're all a bunch of servants well verse 9 we get our bread at the risk of our lives because of the sword in the wilderness so everything is is dangerous to us verse 10 our skin is as hot as an oven because of the fever of the famine they ravished the women in Zion, the maidens in the cities of Judah. The princes were hung up by their hands. The elders were not respected. Young men ground at the millstones. Boys staggered under the loads of wood. The elders have ceased gathering at the gate and the young men from their music. The joy of our heart has ceased. Our dance has turned into mourning. We see here these consequences that will come. The first thing is our hot, our skin is as hot as an oven because of the fever of the famine. In other words, because they're, they're starving, the, their, their bodies begin to break down. And, and so I've never been at that point where my body has starved, where now it becomes hot, you know, where there's just nothing, no, no nourishment, no anything. This is what, you know, the least scholars say that happens to you. So I'll just take them at their word. Verse 11, the women were now ravished. Um, the men of war would go and do unspeakable things to the women, to the maidens. The princes, verse 12, were hung up by their hands. They, they would literally torture them. The elders were not respected. They didn't respect the elders. They just did what they wanted to do, these invading armies. The young men ground at the millstone. Boys staggered under the loads of wood. So all the things that would at one point had been the, the millstones and the, the loads of wood would be given to the oxen and to the mules. That was what they did. They were beasts of burdens. But what happens is this. There were no beasts of burdens. They had already eaten them in the siege. It's like, hey, here's a donkey. He's going to carry my wood. No, here's a donkey. We're going to eat him. So they ate the donkey, they ate the ox, they ate everything they could, and so there were no beasts to do the burdens. And so when it came to it, the young men turned into the beasts of burdens. They were the ones who would grind at the millstones. They were the ones who were staggering under the loads of wood because there were no animals to give them any assistance. The elders, verse 14, ceased gathering at the gates. In other words, there weren't any people to rule. And then it says this, that the young men from their music, they ceased their music. The joy of the heart had ceased and the dance has turned into mourning. In other words, no joy at all. Now, verse 16. The people here come to the place where they begin to acknowledge their sin. And in verse 16 through 18, we see here this acknowledgement. And I think this is so needed and so necessary and as jeremiah is saying this prayer it comes to the point where they're not blaming god anymore they're taking personal consequences it's not why did you allow this to happen and why did that happen and why did this go on in my life and now they're realizing you know what these are just consequences of my sin i've reaped what i've sown and so in verse 16 the crown has fallen from our head woe to us for we have sinned I'll be honest with you, this is one of the most beautiful and most devastating statements that can be made. Why? It's devastating because we realize here, they re it's us, I'm the one who sinned. But it's beautiful because it's what? Now I realize it's me, it's not God. I'm not blaming God and I've taken personal ownership in what I've done. It said, woe to us, this has come because of us. It's not come because God has forsaken us. It's not come because, because God loved us. He's dealing with us as children. And so he's, you know, where, where the writer of Hebrews, my son, do not despise the chastening. Don't despise when God chastens you. Our fathers, they corrected us as, as they thought was necessary, but God only corrects for good. And so we see here, 
woe to us, we have sinned because of this, our heart is faint. Because we have sinned, our heart is faint. Because of these things, because of our sins, our eyes grow dim. Because we're crying and weeping and our eyes we just can't see. All this has happened because I've chosen a path that was contrary to God. And then it says this, because of Mount Zion, which is desolate with the foxes walking about on it. It says our city is turned into a wilderness. And it's our fault. It, it, it isn't God doing this. It isn't Babylon doing it. This is the consequences from our sin. And so they acknowledge their sin. They confessed. And I'll tell you what, that is, is, is when, when we have to confess in our minds like, oh no, I was messed up so badly. Now I got to confess. And then we confess like, oh God, your grace is so good. It just washes. And I'll tell you what, it's sometimes it's really difficult for people to confess their sin. They don't want to admit it. They don't want to do that. There are certain children. Have you ever noticed that there are certain children when you're there to correct, they won't even look at you. I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to look at you. I, I, I can't see you. And, and they, they, they won't look at their parents. And it's interesting that, that here, God says, look at me. You've got to look at me. And he says, you sinned. You've got to admit that you sinned. And finally, you come to that point and says, yeah, all this has happened because we've sinned. It's, there's, there's nothing to anyone else. It's us that have done this. And now in verse 19, we see this, 19 through 22. What they're doing is after they acknowledge their sin, they're accepting their situation. They accept the consequences that come. And I think it's so beautiful. You, you, you acknowledge your sin, and then you accept the situation. Say, okay, God, if this is where it is, I'm going I'm to live with it, but I'm going to walk in a way to glorify you. Remember David after he sinned? Nathan would come and say, David, the sword is never going to leave your house. He says, yeah, you're going to be forgiven, but the sword will never leave your house. And it never did. But what amazing about David and his walk after he sinned was this, that you always see this, that David sought the Lord and worshiped the Lord in the midst of his consequences. He never again said, God, this is, you know, your fault. He said, this is what I've done. You know, people kicking clods at him and everything. Hey, maybe God called him to kick clods at me. That's all right. He leaves Jerusalem, walks away from his son Absalom, crosses the Jordan. Yeah, maybe, you know, if God wants me to come back, he'll bring me back. But if he wants me to leave, I'll leave. He never fought for anything. It's all God's. God, you give it to whom you want. You give it back to who you want. It's all yours. But I love this because in verse 19, he's accepting. And they say this, You, O Lord, remain forever. Your throne from generation to generation. The people now recognize their situation. It's not because of the Babylonian deities. It's not because of Babylon itself. It was because of this. Verse 19, You, O Lord, remain forever. Your throne from generation to generation. God, you're on the throne and you're ruling. It's amazing. They're not pointing to the idols. Well, maybe their idols or their gods are better than our God. No, God, you're still on the throne. I'm acknowledging you're on the throne. I'm acknowledging you never left the throne. And I'm acknowledging that because I'm in this situation, you being on the throne, that this is your authority. And I'm going to acknowledge you. I'm going to acknowledge that this is where you have caused me to be here. You, God, are the one who's disciplined me. You, God, are the one who's brought me here. And then he says this, verse 20, Why do you forget us forever and forsake us for so long a time? Turn us back to you, O Lord, and we will be restored. Renew our days as of old, unless you've utterly rejected us and are very angry with us. So we see two things. One, they say, why do you forget us and forsake us for so long a time? Now keep in mind, the children of Israel would not be forsaken forever. They would be forsaken for 70 years. Now, God had a very specific plan. I'm going to leave you there in Babylon for 70 years. Why? Well, because for 490 years, every seventh year, you should have given the land its rest. And you failed to do so. Now, because I'm God and I said, this land will have rest. And it needs to have rest once every seven years. If you failed to give the land its rest for 490 years, 
There's once every seven. For 70 years, this land should have rested, but only every seventh year it should have rested. Because you never gave it any rest, I'm going to give it 70 in a row. Why? Because you didn't give it 490 in a row. And God said for 70 years. And so he didn't forsake them forever, but he did for 70 years until the land had its rest. And once the land had its rest, now come on back. Now it's done. But I love verse 21, and I want to end with verse 21, because turn us back to you, O Lord, and we shall be restored. Renew our days as of old. Understand this, that God will restore the years the locusts have eaten. The locusts have come and devoured and devoured, and the enemy devours and devours, and God says, listen, I'm going to, I'm going to restore. I'm going to bring you back, and I'm going to make those years that you thought were horrible, I'm going to bless you now in this present. And it's going to be amazing to see what God is going to do. And I love the heart because they said, turn us back. If you turn us back, we will be saved. Now, understanding, realize the New Testament says this, there's not one who seeks after God. No, not one. And even after you've been saved, you don't seek after God. It's God who calls. It's God who beckons. The God who says, just keep coming to me. It's God who puts that upon your heart and God that puts it upon your spirit. I got to come to the Lord in the morning. I got to pray to him and read and find out who he is and find out what he wants to do with my life today. But it's his spirit that draws us in that. And it's his spirit that draws us. Turn us back to you, O Lord. God, you do the work. We will be restored. You do the work. We'll accept your work, accept your authority, and then... We're going to be blessed. And what are we doing? Nothing but accepting you in your work. And then he says, renew us, renew our days as of old. Bring a new joy. Bring a fresh joy. Bring a fresh work. And may that be our heart. Whenever the enemy wants to condemn us, realize, just pray to God. Say, God, you bring my heart back to you. I will worship you, and you're going to renew my days. May that be our heart. Amen.